Chapter 19. Piper. When she recounted her dream for Percy, the ship's toilets exploded. No way are you two going down there alone, Percy said. Leo ran down the hall waving a wrench. Man, did you have to destroy the plumbing? Percy ignored him. Water ran down the gangway. The hull rumbled as more pipes burst and sinks overflowed. Piper guessed that Percy hadn't meant to cause so much damage, but his glowering expression made her want to leave the ship as soon as possible. We'll be all right, Annabeth told him. Piper foresaw the two of us going down there, so that's what needs to happen. Percy glared at Piper like it was all her fault. And this Mimus dude, I'm guessing he's a giant? Probably, she said. Porphyrian called him our brother. And a bronze statue surrounded by fire, Percy said. And those, those other things you mentioned, Mackies? Mackay, Piper said. I think the word means battles in Greek, but uh, I don't know how that applies exactly. That's my point, Percy said. We don't know what's down there. I'm going with you. No, Annabeth put her hand on his arm. If the giants want our blood, the last thing we need is a boy and a girl going down there together. Remember, they want one of each for their big sacrifice. Then I'll get Jason, Percy said, and the two of us. Seaweed Brain, are you implying that two boys can handle this better than two girls? No, I mean, no, but, but... Annabeth kissed him. We'll be back before you know it. Piper followed her upstairs before the whole lower deck could flood with toilet water. An hour later, the two of them stood on a hill overlooking the ruins of ancient Sparta. They'd already scouted the modern city, which strangely reminded Piper of Albuquerque. A bunch of low, boxy, whitewashed buildings sprawled across a plain at the foot of some purplish mountains. Annabeth had insisted on checking the archaeology museum, then the giant metal statue of the Spartan warrior in the public square, then the National Museum of Olives and olive oil. Yes, that was a real thing. Piper had learned more about olive oil than she ever wanted to know. But no giants attacked them. They found no statues of chained gods. Annabeth seemed reluctant to check the ruins on the edge of town, but finally they ran out of other places to look. There wasn't much to see. According to Annabeth, the hill they stood on had once been Sparta's Acropolis, its highest point and main fortress. But it was nothing like the massive Athenian Acropolis Piper had seen in her dreams. The weathered slope was covered with dead grass, rocks and stunted olive trees. Below, ruins stretched out for maybe a quarter of a mile, limestone blocks, a few broken walls and some tiled holes in the ground like wells. Piper thought about her dad's most famous movie, King of Sparta, and how the Spartans were portrayed as invincible supermen. She found it sad that their legacy had been reduced to a field of rubble and a small modern town with an olive oil museum. She wiped the sweat from her forehead. You'd think if there was a 30-foot tall giant around, we'd see him. Annabeth stared at the distant shape of the Argo II floating above downtown Sparta. She fingered the red coral pendant on her necklace, a gift from Percy when they started dating. You're thinking about Percy, Piper guessed. Annabeth nodded. Since she'd come back from Tartarus, Annabeth had told Piper a lot of scary things that had happened down there. At the top of her list, Percy controlling a tide of poison and suffocating the goddess Aklis. He seems to be adjusting, Piper said. He's smiling more often. You know he cares about you more than ever. Annabeth sat, her face suddenly pale. I don't know why it's hitting me so hard all of a sudden. I can't quite get that memory out of my head. How Percy looked when he was standing at the edge of chaos. Maybe Piper was just picking up on Annabeth's uneasiness, but she started to feel agitated as well. She thought about what Jason had said last night. Part of me wanted to close my eyes and stop fighting. She had tried her best to reassure him, but still she worried. Like that Cherokee hunter who changed into a serpent, all demigods had their share of bad spirits inside. Fatal flaws. Some crises brought them out. Some lines shouldn't be crossed. If that was true for Jason, how could it not be true for Percy? The guy had literally been through hell and back. Even when he wasn't trying, he made the toilets explode. What would Percy be like if he wanted to act scary? Give him time. She sat next to Annabeth. The guy is crazy about you. You've been through so much together. I know. Annabeth's grey eyes reflected the green of the olive trees. It's just Bob the Titan. He warned me there would be more sacrifices ahead. I wanted to believe we have a normal life someday, but I allowed myself to hope for that last summer after the Titan War. Then Percy disappeared for months. Then we fell into that pit. A tear traced its way down her cheek. Piper, if you'd seen the face of the god Tartarus, all swirling darkness, devouring monsters and vaporising them, I've never felt so helpless. I try not to think about it. Piper took her friend's hand. They were trembling badly. She remembered her first day at Camp Half-Blood when Annabeth had given her a tour. Annabeth had been shaken up about Percy's disappearance, and though Piper was pretty disoriented and scared herself, comforting Annabeth had made her feel needed, like she might actually have a place among these crazy powerful demigods. Annabeth Chase was the bravest person she knew. 
If even she needed a shoulder to cry on once in a while, well, Piper was glad to offer hers. Hey, she said gently, don't try to shut out the feelings. You won't be able to. Just let them wash over you and drain out again. You're scared. Gods, yes, I'm scared. You're angry. At Percy for frightening me, she said, and my mum for sending me on that horrible quest in Rome. At, well, pretty much everybody. Gaia, the giants, the gods for being jerks. At me? Piper asked. Annabeth managed a shaky laugh. <laughs> yes, for being so annoyingly calm. It's all a lie. And for being a good friend. Ha! And for having your head on straight about guys and relationships and... I'm sorry, have you met me? Annabeth punched her arm, but there was no force to it. I'm stupid, sitting here talking about my feelings when we have a quest to finish. The chain god's heartbeat can wait. Piper tried for a smile, but her own fears welled up inside her. For Jason and her friends on the Argo too, for herself. If she wasn't able to do what Aphrodite had advised, in the end, you will only have the power for one word. It must be the right word, or you will lose everything. Whatever happens, she told Annabeth, I'm your friend. Just remember that, okay? Especially if I'm not around to remind you, Piper thought. Annabeth started to say something. Suddenly a roaring sound came from the ruins. One of the stone-lined pits, which Piper had mistaken for wells, spewed out a three-story geezer of flames and shut off just as quickly. What the heck? Piper asked. Annabeth sighed. I don't know, but I have a feeling it's something we should check out. Three pits lay side by side like finger holes on a recorder. Each one was perfectly round, two feet in diameter, tiled around the rim with limestone. Each one plunged straight into darkness. Every few seconds, seemingly at random, one of the three pits shot a column of fire into the sky. Each time, the colour and intensity of the flames were different. They weren't doing this before. Annabeth walked a wide arc around the pits. She still looked shaky and pale, but her mind was now obviously engaged in the problem at hand. There doesn't seem to be any pattern. The timing, the colour, the height of the fire. I, I don't get it. Did we activate them somehow? Piper wondered. Maybe that surge of fear you felt on the hill. Uh, I, I mean, we both felt. Annabeth didn't seem to hear her. There must be some kind of mechanism. A, a pressure plate, a proximity alarm. Flames shot from the middle pit. Annabeth counted silently. The next time a geezer erupted on the left, she frowned. That's not right. It it's inconsistent. It has to follow some kind of logic. Piper's ears started to ring, something about these pits. Each time one ignited, a horrible thrill went through her, fear, panic, but also a strong desire to get closer to the flames. It isn't rational, she said. It's emotional. How can fire pits be emotional? Piper held her hand over the pit on the right. Instantly, flames leapt up. Piper barely had time to withdraw her fingers. Her nails steamed. Piper? Annabeth ran over. What are you thinking? I wasn't. I was feeling. What we want down here... These pits are the way in. I'll have to jump. Are you crazy? Even if you don't get stuck in the tube, you have no idea how deep it is. You're right. You'll be burned alive. Possibly. Piper unbuckled her sword and tossed it into the pit on the right. I'll let you know if it's safe. Wait for my word. Don't you dare, Annabeth warned. Piper jumped. For a moment, she was weightless in the dark, the sides of the hot stone pit burning her arms, then the space opened up around her. Instinctively, she tucked and rolled, absorbing most of the impact as she hit the stone floor. Flames shot up in front of her, singeing her eyebrows. But Piper snatched up her sword, unsheathed it and swung before she'd even stopped rolling. A bronze dragon head neatly decapitated, wobbled across the floor. Piper stood, trying to get her bearings. She looked down at the fallen dragon head and felt a moment of guilt, as if she'd killed Festus. But this wasn't Festus. Three bronze dragon statues stood in a row, aligned with the holes in the roof. Piper had decapitated the middle one. The two intact dragons were each three feet tall, their snouts pointed upward and their steaming mouths open. They were clearly the source of the flames, but they didn't seem to be automatons. They didn't move or try to attack her. Piper calmly sliced off the heads of the other two. She waited. No more flames shot upward. Piper? Annabeth's voice echoed from far above like she was yelling down a chimney. Yeah? Piper shouted. Thank the gods. Are you okay? Yeah. Hold on a sec. Her eyesight adjusted to the dark. She scanned the chamber. The only light came from her glowing blade in the openings above. The ceiling was about 30 feet high. By all rights, Piper should have broken both legs in the fall, but she wasn't going to complain. The chamber itself was round, about the size of a helicopter pad. The walls were made of rough-hewn stone blocks, chiselled with Greek inscriptions, thousands and thousands of them, like graffiti. At the far end of the room, on a stone dais, stood the human-sized bronze statue of a warrior. The god Ares, Piper guessed, with heavy bronze chains wrapped around his body, anchoring him to the floor. 
On either side of the statue loomed two dark doorways, ten feet high, with a gruesome stone face carved over each archway. The faces reminded Piper of Gorgons, except they had lion's manes instead of snakes for hair. Piper suddenly felt very much alone. Annabeth, she called. It's a long drop, but it's safe to come down. Maybe uh, you have a rope you could fasten so we can get back up? On it. A few minutes later, a ro rope dropped from the centre pit. Annabeth shinned down. Piper McLean, she grumbled. That was without a doubt the dumbest risk I've ever seen anyone take. And I date a dumb risk taker. Thank you. Piper nudged the nearest decapitated dragon head with her foot. I'm guessing these are the dragons of Ares. That's one of his sacred animals, right? And there's the chained god himself. Where do you think those doorways? Piper held up her hand. Do you hear that? The sound was like a drumbeat with a metallic echo. It's coming from inside the statue, Piper decided. The heartbeat of the chained god. Annabeth unsheathed her dracon bone sword. In the dim light, her face was ghostly pale, her eyes colourless. I... I don't like this, Piper. We need to leave. The rational part of Piper agreed. Her skin crawled. Her legs ached to run. But something about this room felt strangely familiar. The shrine is ramping up our emotions, she said. It's like being around my mum, except this place radiates fear, not love. That's why you started feeling overwhelmed on the hill. Down here, it's a thousand times stronger. Annabeth scanned the walls. Okay, we need a plan to get the statue out. Maybe haul it up with a rope, but wait. Piper glanced at the snarling stone faces above the doorways. A shrine that radiates fear. Ares had two divine sons, didn't he? Uh, Ph Phobos and Deimos? Annabeth shivered. Panic and fear. Percy met them once in Staten Island. Piper decided not to ask what the twin gods of panic and fear had been doing in Staten Island. I think those are the faces above the doors. This place isn't just a shrine to Ares. It's a temple of fear. Deep laughter echoed through the chamber. On Piper's right, a giant appeared. He didn't come through either doorway. He simply emerged from the darkness as if he'd been camouflaged against the wall. He was small for a giant, perhaps 25 feet tall, which would give him enough room to swing the massive sledgehammer in his hands. His armour, his skin and his dragon scale legs were all the colour of charcoal. Copper wires and smashed circuit boards glittered in the braids of his oil black hair. Very good, child of Aphrodite. The giant smiled. This is indeed the Temple of Fear. And I am here to make you believers. Chapter 20. Piper. Piper knew fear, but this was different. Waves of terror crashed over her. Her joints turned to jelly. Her heart refused to beat. Her worst memories crowded her mind. Her father tied up and beaten in Mount Diablo. Percy and Jason fighting to the death in Kansas. The three of them drowning in the Nymphaeum in Rome. Herself standing alone against Keonia and the Boreads. Worst of all, she relived her conversation with her mother about what was to come. Paralysed, she watched as the giant raised his sledgehammer to smash them flat. At the last moment, she leapt to one side, taking and tackling Annabeth. The hammer cracked the floor, peppering Piper's back with stone shrapnel. The giant chuckled. Oh, that wasn't fair. He hefted his sledgehammer again. Annabeth, get up. Piper helped her to her feet. She pulled her towards the far end of the room, but Annabeth moved sluggishly, her eyes wide and unfocused. Piper understood why. The temple was amplifying their personal fears. Piper had seen some horrible things, but it was nothing compared to what Annabeth had experienced. If she was having flashbacks of Tartarus, enhanced and compounded with all her other bad memories, her mind wouldn't be able to cope. She might literally go insane. I'm here, Piper promised, filling her voice with reassurance. We will get out of this. The giant laughed. A child of Aphrodite leading a child of Athena. Now I've seen everything. How would you defeat me, girl, with makeup and fashion tips? A few months ago, that comment might have stung, but Piper was way past that. The giant lumbered towards them. Fortunately, he was slow and carrying a heavy hammer. Annabeth, trust me, Piper said. A, a plan, she stammered. I go left, you go right. If we... Annabeth, no plans. W what? No plans, just follow me. The giant swung his hammer, but they dodged it easily. Piper leapt forward and slashed her sword across the back of the giant's knee. As the giant be bellowed in outrage, Piper pulled Annabeth into the nearest tunnel. Immediately, they were engulfed in total darkness. Fools! The giant roared somewhere behind them. That is the wrong way! Keep moving. Piper held tight to Annabeth's hand. It's fine, come on. She couldn't see anything. Even the glow of her sword was snuffed out. Snuffed out. She barreled ahead anyway, trusting her emotions. From the echo of their footfalls, the space around them must have been a vast cavern, but she couldn't be sure. 
She simply went in the direction that made the fe her fear the sharpest. Piper, it's like the house of night, Annabeth said. We should close our eyes. No, Piper said. Keep them open. We can't try to hide. The giant's voice came from somewhere in front of them. Lost forever, swallowed by the darkness. Annabeth froze, forcing Piper to stop too. Why did we just plunge in? Annabeth demanded. We're lost. We did what he wanted us to. We should have bided our time, talked to the enemy, figured out a plan. That always works. Annabeth, I never ignore your advice. Piper kept her voice soothing, but this time I have to. We can't defeat this place with reason. You can't think your way out of your emotions. The giant's laughter echoed like a detonating depth charge. Despair, Annabeth Chase. I am Mimus, born to slay Hephaestus. I am the breaker of plans, the destroyer of the well-oiled machines. Nothing goes right in my presence. Maps are misread, devices break, data is lost, the finest minds turn to mush. I, I faced worse than you, Annabeth cried. Oh, I see. The giant sounded much closer now. Are you not afraid? Never. Of course we're afraid, Piper corrected, terrified. The air moved. Just in time, Piper pushed Annabeth to one side. Crash! Suddenly, they were back in the circular room. The dim light, almost blinding now. The giant stood close by, trying to yank his hammer out of the floor, where he'd embedded it. Piper lunged and drove her blade into the giant's thigh. Urgh! Lemus let go of the hammer and arched his back. Piper and Annabeth scrambled behind the chained statue of Ares, which still pulsed with a metallic heartbeat. Thump, thump, thump. The giant Mimas turned towards them. The wound on his leg was already closing. You cannot defeat me, he growled. In the last war, it took two gods to bring me down. I was born to kill Hephaestus, and would have done so if Ares hadn't ganged up on me as well. You should have stayed paralysed in your fear. Your death would have been quicker. Days ago, when she faced Keone on the Argo 2, Piper had started talking about think without thinking, following her heart no matter what her brain said. Now she did the same thing. She moved in front of the statue and faced the giant, though the rational part of her screamed, Run, you idiot! This temple, she said. The Spartans didn't chain Ares because they wanted his spirit to stay in their city. You think not? The giant's eyes glittered with amusement. He wrapped his hands around his sledgehammer and pulled it from the floor. This is the temple of my brothers, Deimos and Phobos. Piper's voice shook, but she didn't try to hide it. The Spartans came here to prepare for battle, to face their fears. Ares was chained to remind them that war has consequences. His power, the spirits of battle, the Makai, should never be unleashed unless you understand how terrible they are, unless you felt fear. Mimas laughed. A child of the love goddess lectures me about war. What do you know of the Makai? We'll see. Piper ran straight at the giant, unbalancing his stance. At the sight of her jagged blade coming at him, his eyes widened and he stumbled backwards, cracking his head against the wall. A jagged fissure snaked upward in the stones. Dust rained from the ceiling. Piper, this place is unstable, Annabeth warned. If we don't leave, don't think about escape. Piper ran towards their rope, which dangled from the ceiling. She leapt as high as she could and cut it. Piper, have you lost your mind? Probably, she thought. But Piper knew this was the only way to survive. She had to go against reason, follow emotion instead, keep the giant off balance. That hurt. Mimas rubbed his head. You realise you cannot kill me without the help of a guard and Ares is not here. The next time I face the, that blustering idiot, I will smash him to bits. I wouldn't have had to fight him in the first place if that cowardly fool Damazan had done his job. Annabeth let loose a guttural cry. Do not insult Damazan. She ran at Mimas, who barely managed to parry her dracon blade with the handle of his hammer. He tried to grab Annabeth, and Piper lunged, slashing her blade across the side of the giant's face. Gah! Mimas staggered. A severed pile of dreadlocks fell to the floor along with something else, a large fleshy thing, lying in a pool of golden ichor. My ear! Mimas wailed. Before he could recover his wits, Piper grabbed Annabeth's arm and together they plunged through the second doorway. I will bring down this chamber, the giant thundered. The earth mother shall deliver me, but you shall be crushed. The floor shook. The sound of breaking stone echoed all around them. Piper stood and stopped. Annabeth begged. Ha how are you dealing with this? The fear, the anger. Don't try to control it. That's what the temple is about. You have to accept the fear, adapt to it, ride it like the rapids on a river. How do you know that? I don't know it. I just feel it. 
Somewhere nearby, a wall crumbled with a sound like an artillery blast. You cut the rope, Annabeth said. We're going to die down here. Piper cupped her friend's face. She pulled Annabeth forward until their foreheads touched. Through her fingertips, she could feel Annabeth's rapid pulse. Fear can't be reasoned with. Neither can hate. They're like love. They're almost identical emotions. That's why Ares and Aphrodite like each other. Their twin sons, fear and panic, were spawned from both war and love. But I don't... This doesn't make sense. No, Piper agreed. Stop thinking about it. Just feel. I hate that. I know. You can't plan for feelings. Like with Percy and your future. You can't control every contingency. You have to accept that. Let it scare you. Trust that it'll be okay anyway. Annabeth shook her head. I don't know if I can. Then, for right now, concentrate on revenge for Damason. Revenge for Bob. A moment of silence. I'm good now. Great, because I need your help. We're going to run out of there together. Then what? I have no idea. Gods, I hate it when you lead. Piper laughed, which surprised even her. Fear and love really were related. At that moment, she clung to the love she had for her friend. Come on. They ran in no particular direction and found themselves back in the shrine room, right behind the giant Mimas. They each slashed one of his legs and brought him to his knees. The giant howled. More chunks of stone tumbled from the ceiling. Weak mortals! Mima struggled to it to stand. No plan of yours can defeat me. That's good, Piper said, because I don't have a plan. She ran towards the statue of Ares. Annabeth, keep our friend occupied. Oh, he's occupied. Arrgh! Piper stared at the cruel bronze face of the war god. The statue thrummed with a low metallic pulse. The spirits of battle, she thought. They're inside, waiting to be freed. But they weren't hers to unleash, not until she'd proven herself. The chamber shook again. More cracks appeared in the walls. Piper glanced at the stone carvings above the doorways, the scowling twin faces of fear and panic. My brothers, Piper said, sons of Aphrodite, I give you a sacrifice. At the feet of Ares, she set her cornucopia. The magic horn had become so attuned to her emotions it could amplify her anger, love or grief and spew forth its bounty accordingly. She hoped that would appeal to the gods of fear or maybe they would just appreciate some fresh fruits and vegetables in their diets. I'm terrified, she confessed. I hate doing this, but I accept that it's necessary. She swung her blade and took off the bronze statue's head. No! Mimas yelled. Flames roared up from the statue's severed neck. They swirled around Piper, filling the room with a firestorm of emotions. Hatred, bloodlust and fear, but also love. Because no one could face battle without caring for something. Comrades, family, home. Piper held out her arms and the Makai made her the centre of their whirlwind. We will answer your call, they whispered in her mind. Once only when you need us. Destruction, waste, carnage shall answer. We shall complete your cure. The flames vanished along with the cornucopia and the chained statue of Ares crumbled into dust. Foolish girl, Mimas charged her. Annabeth at his heels. The Makai have abandoned you. Or maybe they've abandoned you, Piper said. Mimas raised his hammer, but he'd forgotten about Annabeth. She jabbed him in the thigh and the giant staggered forward off balance. Piper stepped in calmly and stabbed him in the gut. Mimas crashed face first into the nearest doorway. He turned over, just as the stone face of panic cracked off the wall above him and toppled down for a one-ton kiss. The giant's cry was cut short. His body went still. Then he disintegrated into a twenty-foot pile of ash. Annabeth stared at Piper. What just happened? I'm not sure. Piper, you were amazing, but those fiery spirits you released, the Makai, how does that help us find the cure we're looking for? I don't know. They said I could summon them when the time comes. Maybe Artemis and Apollo can explain. A section of the wall carved like a glacier. Annabeth stumbled and almost slipped on the giant's severed ear. We need to get out of here. I'm working on it, Piper said. And uh, I think this ear is your spoil of war. Gross. Would make a lovely shield. Shut up, Chase. Piper stared at the second doorway, which still had the face of fear above it. Thank you, brothers, for helping to kill the giant. I need one more favour, an escape. And believe me, I am properly terrified. I offer you this, a uh, lovely ear as a sacrifice. The stone face made no answer. Another section of the wall peeled away. A starburst of cracks appeared in the ceiling. Piper grabbed Annabeth's hand. We're going through that doorway. If this works, we might find ourselves back on the surface. And if it doesn't? Piper looked up at the face of fear. Let's find out. The room collapsed around them as they plunged into the dark. 
Chapter 21. Rainer. At least they didn't end up on another cruise ship. The jump from Portugal had landed them in the middle of the Atlantic, where Rainer had spent her whole day on the light Lido, on the Lido deck of the Azores Queen, shooing little kids off the Athena Parthenos, which they seemed to think was a water slide. Unfortunately, the next jump brought Rainer home. They appeared ten feet in the air, hovering over a restaurant courtyard that Rainer recognised. She and Nico dropped onto a large birdcage, which promptly broke, dumping them into a cluster of potted ferns, along with three very alarmed parrots. Coach Hedge hit the canopy over a bar. The Athena Parthenos landed on her feet with a thump, flattening a patio table and flipping a dark green umbrella, which settled onto the Nike statue in Athena's hand, so the goddess of wisdom looked like she was holding a tropical drink. Gah! Coach Hedge yelled. The canopy ripped and he fell behind the bar with a crash of bottles and glasses. The satyr recovered well. He popped up with a dozen miniature plastic swords in his hair, grabbed the soda gun and served himself a drink. I like it. He tossed a wedge of pineapple into his mouth. But next time, kid, can we land on the floor and not ten feet above it? Nico dragged himself out of the ferns. He collapsed into the nearest chair and waved off a blue parrot that was trying to land on his head. After the fight with Lycon, Nico had discarded his shredded aviator jacket. His black skull pattern t-shirt wasn't in much better shape. Rainer had stitched up the gashes on his biceps, which gave Nico a slightly creepy Frankenstein look, but the cuts were still swollen and red. Unlike bites, werewolf claw marks wouldn't transmit lycanthropy, but Rainer knew firsthand that they healed slowly and burned like acid. I've got to go. I've got to sleep. Nico looked up in a daze. Are we safe? Rainer scanned the courtyard. The place seemed deserted, though she didn't understand why. This time of night it should have been packed. Above them the evening sky glowed a murky terracotta, the same colour as the building's walls. Ringing the atrium, the second-story balconies were empty except for potted azaleas hanging from the white metal railings. Behind a wall of glass doors, the restaurant's interior was dark. The only sound was the fountain gurgling forlornly and the occasional squawk of a disgruntled parrot. This is Barakina, Rainer said. What kind of bear? Hedge opened a jar of maraschino cherries and chugged them down. It's a famous restaurant, Rainer said, in the middle of old San Juan. They invented the pina colada here back in the 1960s, I think. Nico pitched out of his chair, curled up on the floor and started snoring. Coach Hedge belched. Well, it looks like we're staying for a while. If they haven't invented any new drinks since the 60s, they're overdue. I'll get to work. While Hedge rummaged behind the bar, Rayner whistled for Aurum and Argentum. After their fight with the werewolves, the dogs looked a little worse for wear, but Rayner placed them on guard duty. She checked the street entrance to the atrium. The decorative ironwork gates were locked. A sign in Spanish and English announced that the restaurant was closed to a private party. That seemed odd, since the place was deserted. At the bottom of the sign were embossed initials HTK. These bothered Rainer, though she wasn't sure why. She peered through the gates. Cal Fortaleza was unusually quiet. The blue cobblestone pavement was free of traffic and pedestrians. The pastel-coloured shop fronts were closed and dark. Was it Sunday? Or some sort of holiday? Rainer's unease grew. Behind her, Coach Hedge whistled happily as he set up a row of blenders. The parrots roosted on the shoulders of the Athena Parthenos. Rainer wondered whether the Greeks would be offended if their sacred statue arrived covered in tropical bird poop. Of all the places Rainer could have ended up, San Juan. Maybe it was a coincidence, but she feared not. Puerto Rico wasn't really on the way from Europe to New York. It wasn't much too far south. It was much too far south. Besides, Rainer had been lending Nico her strength for days now. Perhaps she'd influenced him subconsciously. He was drawn to painful thoughts, fear and darkness. And Rainer's darkest, most painful memory was San Juan. Her biggest fear? Coming back here. Her dogs picked up on her agitation. They prowled the courtyard, snarling at shadows. Poor Argentum turned in circles, trying to aim his head sideways head so he could see out of his one ruby eye. Rainer tried to concentrate on positive memories. She'd missed the sound of the little cocky frogs singing around the neighbourhood like a chorus of popping bottle caps. She'd missed the smell of the ocean, the blossoming magnolias and citrus trees, the fresh-baked bread from the local panaderas. Even the humidity felt comfortable and familiar, like the scented air from a dry event. Part of her wanted to open the gates and explore the city. She wanted to visit the Plaza de Amas, where the old men played dominoes and the coffee kiosk sold espresso so strong it made your ears pop. She wanted to stroll down her old street, Cal San Jose, counting and naming the stray cats, 
making up a story for each one, the way she used to with her sister. She wanted to break into Barakina's kitchen and cook up some real mofongo with fried plantains and bacon and garlic, a taste that would always remind her of a Sunday afternoon when she and Hilla could briefly escape the house and, if they were lucky, eat here in the kitchen where the staff knew them and took pity on them. On the other hand, Reina wanted to leave immediately. She wanted to wake up Nico, no matter how tired he was, and force him to shadow travel out of here, anywhere but San Juan. Being so close to her old house made Reina feel ratcheted, tight, like a catapult winch. She glanced at Nico. Despite the warm night, he shivered on the tile floor. She pulled a blanket out of her pack and covered him up. Reina no longer felt self-conscious about wanting to protect him. For better or worse, they shared a connection now. Each time they shadow travelled, his exhaustion and torment washed over her and she understood him a little better. Nico was devastatingly alone. He'd lost his big sister Bianca, he'd pushed away all other demigods who'd tried to get close to him. His experiences at Camp Half-Blood, in the Labyrinth and in Tartarus, had left him scarred, afraid to trust anyone. Reyna doubted she could change his feelings, but she wanted Nico to have support. All heroes deserved that. It was the whole point of the Twelfth Legion. You joined forces to fight for a higher cause. You weren't alone. You made friends and earned respect. Even when you mustered out, you had a place in the community. No demigod should have to suffer alone in the way Nico did. Tonight was the 25th of July, seven more days until the 1st of August. In theory, that was plenty of time to reach Long Island. Once they completed their mission, if they completed their mission, Rayner would make sure Nico was recognised for his bravery. She slipped off her backpack. She tried to place it under Nico's head as a makeshift pillow, but her fingers passed right through him as if he were a shadow. She recoiled her hand. Cold with dread, she tried again. This time she was able to lift her neck, his neck and slide the pillow under. His skin felt cool, but otherwise normal. Had she been hallucinating? Nico had expe expended so much energy travelling through shadows. Perhaps he was starting to fade permanently. If he kept pushing himself to the limit for seven more days. The sound of a blender startled her out of her thoughts. You want a smoothie? asked the coach. This one is pineapple, mango, orange and banana buried under a mound of shaved coconut. I call it the Hercules. Uh, I'm all right, thanks. She glanced up at the balconies, ringing the atrium. It still didn't seem right to her that the restaurant was empty. A private party. HTK. Coach, I think I'll scout the second floor. I don't like... A wisp of movement caught her eye. The balcony on the right. A dark shape. Above that, at the edge of the roof, several more silhouettes appeared against the orange clouds. Raina drew her sword, but it was too late. A flash of silver, a faint whoosh, and the point of a needle buried itself in her neck. Her vision blurred, her limbs turned to spaghetti. She collapsed next to Nico. As her eyes dimmed, she saw her dogs running towards her, but they froze in mid-bark and toppled over. At the bar, the coach yelled, Hey! Another whoosh. The coach collapsed with a silver dart in his neck. Raina tried to say, Nico, wake up. Her voice wouldn't work. Her body had been deactivated as completely as her metal dogs had. Dark figures lined the rooftop. Half a dozen leapt into the courtyard, silent and graceful. One leaned over Raina. She could only make out a hazy smudge of grey. A muffled voice said, take her. A cloth sack was wrestled over her head. Raina wondered dimly if this was how she would die, without even a fight. Then it didn't matter. Several pairs of rough hands lifted her like an unwieldy piece of furniture, and she drifted into unconsciousness. Chapter 22. Raina. The answer came to her before she was fully conscious. The initials on the sign at Barakina. HTK. Not funny, Raina muttered to herself. Not remotely funny. Years ago, Lupa had taught her how to sleep lightly, wake up alert and be ready to attack. Now, as her senses returned, she took stock of her situation. The cloth sack still covered her head, but it didn't seem to be cinched around her neck. She was tied to a hard chair, wood by the feel of it. Cords were tight against the ribs, her hands were bound behind her, but her legs were free at the ankles. Either her captors were sloppy, or they hadn't expected her to wake up so quickly. Raina wriggled her fingers and toes. Whatever tranquilizer they'd used, the effects had worn off. Somewhere in front of her, footsteps echoed down a corridor, the sound got closer. Raina let her muscles go slack. She rested her chin against her chest. A lock clicked. A door creaked open. Judging from the acoustics, Raina was in a small room with brick or concrete walls, maybe a basement or a cell. One person entered the room. Raina calculated the distance. No more than five feet. She surged upward, spinning so the chair legs smashed against her captor's body. The force broke the chair. Her captor fell with a pained grunt. 
Shouts from the corridor, more footsteps. Raina shook the cloth sack off her head. She dropped into a backward roll, pulling her bound hands under her legs so her arms were in front of her. Her captor, a teen girl in grey camouflage, lay dazed on the floor, a knife at her belt. Raina grabbed the knife and straddled her, pressing the blade against her captor's throat. Three more girls crowded around the doorway. Two drew knives, the third knocked an arrow in her bow. For a moment, everyone froze. Her hostages carotid artery, carotid artery pulsed under the blade. Wisely, the girl made no attempt to move. Raina ran scenarios on how she could overcome the three in the doorway. All of them wore grey camouflage t-shirts, faded black jeans, black athletic shoes and utility belts, as if they were going camping or hiking or hunting. You're the hunters of Artemis, Raina realised. Take it easy, said the girl with the bow. Her ginger hair was shaved on the sides, long on top. She had the build of a professional wrestler. You've got the wrong impression. The girl on the floor exhaled, but Raina knew that trick, trying to loosen an enemy's hold. Raina pressed the knife tighter against the girl's throat. You've got the wrong impression, Raina said. If you think you can attack me and take me captive, where are my friends? Unharmed, right where you left them. The ginger girl promised. Look, it's three to one and your hands are tied. You're right, Raina growled. Get another six of you in here, it might be a fair fight. I demand to see your lieutenant, Thalia Grace. The ginger girl blinked. Her comrades gripped their knives uneasily. On the floor, Raina's hostage began to shake. Raina thought she might be having a fit. Then she realised the girl was laughing. Something funny, Raina asked. The girl's voice was a gravelly whisper. Jason told me you were good. He didn't say how good. Raina focused more carefully on her hostage. The girl looked about 16, with choppy black hair and startling blue eyes. Across her forehead glinted a circlet of silver. You're Thalia? And I'd be happy to explain, Thalia said if you kindly not cut my throat. The hunters guided her through a maze of corridors. The walls were concrete blocks, painted army green, devoid of windows. The only light came from dim fluorescence spaced every 20 feet. The passages twisted, turned and doubled back, but the ginger-haired hunter, Phoebe, took the lead. She seemed to know where she was going. Thalia Grace limped along, holding her ribs where Raina had hit her with a chair. The hunter must have been in pain, but her eyes sparkled with amusement. Again, my apologies for abducting you. Thalia didn't sound very sorry. This lair is secret. The Amazons have certain protocols. The Amazons? You work for them? With them? Thalia corrected. We have a mutual understanding. Sometimes the Amazons send recruits our way. Sometimes, if we come across girls who don't wish to be maidens forever, we send them to the Amazons. The Amazons do not have such vows. One of the other hunters snorted in disgust. Keeping male slaves in collars and orange jumpsuits. I'd rather keep a pack of dogs any day. Their males aren't slaves, Killin, Thalia chided, merely subservient. She glanced at Raina. The Amazons and hunters don't see eye to eye on everything, but since Gaia began to stir, we have been cooperating closely. With Camp Jupiter and Camp Half-Blood at each other's throats, well, someone has to deal with all the monsters. Our forces are spread across the entire continent. Raina massaged the rope marks on her wrists. I thought you told Jason you knew nothing of Camp Jupiter. That was true then. But those days are over, thanks to Hera's scheming. Thalia's expression turned serious. How is my brother? When I left him in Epirus, he was fine. Raina told her what she knew. She found Thalia's eyes distracting, electric blue, intense and alert, so much like Jason's. Otherwise, the siblings looked nothing alike. Thalia's hair was choppy and dark. Her jeans were tattered, held together with safety pins. She wore metal chains around her neck and wrists, and her grey camo shirt sported a badge that read, Punk is not dead. You are. Raina had always thought of Jason Grace as the All-American boy. Thalia looked more like the girl who robbed All-American boys at knife point in an alley. I hope he's still well, Thalia mused. A few nights ago, I dreamt about our mother. It wasn't pleasant. Then I got Nico's message in my dreams about Orion hunting you. That was even less pleasant. That's why you're here. You got Nico's message. Well, we didn't rush to Puerto Rico for a vacation. This is one of the Amazon's most secure strongholds. We took a gamble that we'd be able to in intercept you. Intercept us? How? And why? In front of them, Phoebe stopped. The cor corridor dead-ended at a set of metal doors. Phoebe tapped on them with the butt of her knife, a complicated series of knocks like Morse code. Thalia rubbed her bruised ribs. I'll have to leave you here. The hunters are patrolling the old city, keeping a lookout for Orion. I need to get back to the front lines. She held out her hand expectantly. My knife, please. Raina handed it back. What about my own weapons? They'll be returned when you leave. 
I know it seems silly, the kidnapping and blindfolding and whatnot, but the Amazons take their security seriously. Last month they had an incident at their main centre in Seattle. Maybe you heard about it. A girl named Hazel Levesque stole a horse. The hunter, Kaylin, grinned. Naomi, and I saw the security footage. Legendary. Epic, agreed the third hunter. At any rate, Falia said, we're keeping an eye on Nico and the satyr. Unauthorised males aren't allowed anywhere near this place, but we left them a note so they wouldn't worry. From her belt, Falia unfolded a piece of paper. She handed it to Rayner. It was a photocopy of a handwritten note. IOU 1 Roman Praetor. She will be returned safely. Sit tight, otherwise you'll be killed. XOX, the Hunters of Artemis. Rayner handed back the letter. Right, that won't worry them at all. Phoebe grinned. It's cool. I covered your Athena Parthenos with this new camouflage netting I designed. It should keep monsters, even Orion, from finding it. Besides, if my guess is right, Orion isn't tracking the statue as much as he's tracking you. Raina felt like she'd been punched between the eyes. How could you know that? Phoebe is my best tracker, Thalia said, and my best healer. And, well, she's generally right about most things. Most things, Phoebe protested. Thalia raised her hands in a I give up gesture. As for why we intercepted you, I'll let the Amazons explain, Phoebe. Phoebe, Kellyn, Naomi, accompany Raina inside. I have to see to our defences. You're expecting a fight? Raina noted. But you said this place was secret and secure. Thalia sheathed her knife. You don't know Orion. I wish we had more time, Praetor. I'd like to hear about your camp and how you ended up there. You remind me so much of your sister, and yet... You know Hilla? Raina asked. Is she safe? Thalia tilted her head. None of us are safe these days. Praetor, so I really must go. Good hunting. Thalia disappeared down the corridor. The metal doors creaked open. The three hunters led Raina through. After the claustrophobic tunnels, the size of the warehouse took Raina's breath away. An eerie of giant eagles could have done manoeuvres under the vast ceiling. Three-storey tall rows of shelves stretched into the distance. Robotic for forklifts zipped through the aisles retrieving boxes. Half a dozen young women in black trouser suits stood nearby comparing notes on their tablet computers. In front of them were crates labelled Explosive Arrows in Greek Fire, 16 ounces, Easy Open Pack, and Griffin Fillets, Free Range Organic. Directly in front of Raina, behind a conference table piled high with reports and bladed weapons, sat a familiar figure. Baby sister, Hilla Rose, here we are home again, facing certain death again. We have to stop meeting like this. Chapter 23. Rainer. Rainer's feelings weren't so much mixed. They were thrown into a blender with gravel and ice. Every time she saw her sister, she didn't know whether to hug her, cry or walk away. Of course she loved Hiller. Rainer would have been dead many times over, over if it was not for her sister. But their past together was beyond complicated. Hiller walked around the table. She looked good in her black leather trousers and black vest top. Around her waist glittered a cord of gold labyrinthine links, the belt of the Amazon Queen. She was 22 now, but she could have been mistaken for Raina's twin. They had the same long dark hair, the same brown eyes. They even wore the same silver ring with the torch and spear emblem of their mother, Bellona. The most obvious difference between them was the long white scar on Hilla's forehead. It had faded over the last four years. Anyone who didn't know better might have mistaken it for a worry line. But Raina remembered the day Hilla got that scar in a duel on board the pirate ship. Well, Hilla prompted, no warm words for your sister? Thank you for having me abducted, Rayner said, for shooting me with a tranquilizer dart, putting a bag over my head and tying me to a chair. Hilla rolled her eyes. Rules are rules. As a praetor, you should understand that. This distribution centre is one of our most important bases. We have to control access. I can't make exceptions, especially not for my family. I think you just enjoyed it. That too. Rayner wondered if her sister was as cool and collected as she seemed. She found it amazing, and a little scary how quickly Hilla had adapted to her new identity. Six years ago, she'd been a scared big sister, doing her best to shield Rayner from their father's rage. Her main skills had been running and finding them places to hide. Then, on Circe's island, Hilla had worked hard to be noticed. She wore flashy clothes and makeup. She smiled and laughed and always stayed perky, as if acting happy would make her happy. She'd become one of Circe's favourite attendants. After their island sanctuary burned, they were taken prisoner aboard the pirate ship. Again, Hilla changed. She dueled for their freedom, out-pirated the pirates, gained the crew's respect so well that Blackbeard finally put them ashore, lest Hella take over his ship. Now she'd reinvented herself again as Queen of the Amazons. 
Of course, Raina understood why her sister was such a chameleon. If she kept changing, she would never fossilise into the thing their father had become. Those initials on the reservation sign at Barakina, Raina said, HTK, Hiller, twice kill. Your new nickname? A little joke? Just checking to see if you were paying attention. You knew we would land in that courtyard. How? Hiller shrugged. Shadow travel is magic. Several of my followers are daughters of Hikati. It was a simple enough matter for them to pull you off course, especially since you and I share a connection. Raina tried to keep her anger in check. Hilla, of all people, should know how she would feel about being dragged back to Puerto Rico. You want to, You went to a lot of trouble, Raina noted. The Queen of the Amazons and the Lieutenant of Artemis, both rushing to Puerto Rico on a moment's notice to intercept us. I'm guessing that's not because you missed me. Phoebe, the ginger-haired hunter, chuckled. She's smart. Of course, Hilla said. I taught her everything she knows. Other Amazons started to gather round, possibly sensing a potential fight. Amazons loved violent entertainment almost as much as pirates did. Orion, Raina guessed, that's what brought you here. His name got your attention. I couldn't let you kill him. I couldn't let him kill you, Hilla said. It's more than that. Your mission is to escort the Athena Parthenos. It's important, but it's more than that too. This is a personal, this is personal for you and for the hunters. What's your game? Hilla ran her thumbs along her golden belt. Orion is a problem. Unlike the other giants, Orion has been walking the earth for centuries. He takes a special interest in killing Amazons or hunters or any female who dares to be strong. Why would he want that? A ripple of dread seemed to pass through the girls around her. Hilla looked at Phoebe. Do you want to explain? Do you? You were there. The hunter's smile faded. In the ancient times, Orion joined the hunters. He was Lady Artemis's best friend. He had no rivals at the bow except for the goddess herself and perhaps her brother Apollo. Raina shivered. Phoebe looked no older than fourteen to think that she knew Orion three or four thousand years ago. What went wrong? she asked. Phoebe's ears reddened. Orion crossed the line. He fell in love with Artemis. Hilla sniffed. Always happens with men. They promise friendship. They promise to treat you as an equal. In the end all they want is to possess you. Phoebe picked at her thumbnail. Behind her, the other two hunters, Naomi and Celine, shifted uneasily. Lady Artemis rebuffed him, of course, Phoebe said. Orion became bitter. He started going on longer and longer trips by himself in the wilderness. Finally, I'm not sure what happened. One day Artemis came back to camp and told us Orion had been killed. She refused to speak of it. Hilla frowned, which accentuated the white scar across her brow. Whatever the case, when Orion rose again from Tartarus, he was Artemis's bitterest enemy. No one can hate you with more intensity than someone who used to love you. Raina understood that. She fought back to a conversation she'd had with the goddess Aphrodite two years ago in Charleston. If he's such a problem, Raina said, why doesn't Artemis simply slay him again? Phoebe grimaced. Easier said than done. Orion is sneaky. Whenever Artemis is with us, he stays far away. Whenever we hunters are on our own, like we are now, he strikes without warning and disappears again. Our last lieutenant, Zoe Nightshade, spent centuries trying to track him down and kill him. The Amazons have also tried, Hilla said. Orion doesn't distinguish between us and the hunters. I think we all remind him too much of Artemis. He sabotages our warehouses, disrupts our distribution centres, kills our warriors. In other words, Raina said dryly, he's getting in the way of your plans for world domination. Hilla shrugged. Exactly. That's why you rushed here to intercept me, Raina said. You knew Orion would be right behind me. You're setting up an ambush. I'm the bait. The other girls all found somewhere else to look besides Raina's face. Oh, please, Raina chided. Don't develop a guilty conscience now. It's a good plan. How do we proceed? Hilla gave her comrades a lopsided smile. I told you my sister was tough. Phoebe, you want to explain the details? The hunter shouldered her bow. Like I said, I believe Orion is tracking you, not the Athena Parthenos. He seems especially good at sensing the presence of female demigods. I guess you'd say that we're his natural prey. Charming, Raina said. So my friends, Nico and Gleason Hedge, are they safe? I still don't see why you travel with males, Phoebe grumbled. But my guess is that they are safer without you around. I did my best to camouflage your statue. With luck, Orion will follow you here, straight into our line of defences. And then? Raina asked. Hilla gave her the sort of cold smile that used to make Blackbeard's pirates nervous. Thalia and most of her hunters are scouting the perimeter of Diego San Juan. As soon as Horion gets close, we'll know. We've set traps at every approach. I have my best fighters on alert. We'll snare the giant, then one way or another, 
will send him back to Tartarus. Can he be killed? Rainer asked. I thought most giants could only be destroyed by a god and a demigod working together. We intend to find out, Hilla said. Once Orion is taken down, your quest will be much easier. We'll send you on your way with our blessings. We could use more than your blessings, Rainer said. Amazon ships, well, they ship things all around the world. Why not provide safe transport for the Athena Parthenos? Get us to Camp Halfblood before August 1st. I can't, Hilla said. If I could, sister, I would, but surely you felt the anger radiating from the statue. We Amazons are honorary daughters of Ares. The Athena Parthenos would never tolerate our interference. Besides, you know how the fates operate. For your quest to succeed, you have to deliver the statue personally. Raina must have looked crestfallen. Phoebe shoulder-bumped her like an over-friendly cat. Hey, not so glum. We'll help you as much as we can. The Amazon service department has repaired those metal dogs of yours, and we have some cool parting gifts. Celine handed Phoebe a leather satchel. Phoebe rummaged inside. Let's see, healing potions? Tranquilizer darts like the ones we used on you? Hmm, what else? Oh yeah. Phoebe triumphantly produced a rectangle of folded silvery cloth. A handkerchief? Rainer asked. Better. Back up a little. Phoebe tossed the cloth on the floor. Instantly, it expanded into a ten by ten camping tent. It's air conditioned, Phoebe said. Sleeps four. It has a buffet table and sleeping bags inside. Whatever extra gear you put in, it will collapse with the tent. Um, within reason. Don't try to stick your giant statue in there. Celine snickered. If your male travelling companions get annoying, you could always leave them inside. Naomi frowned. That wouldn't work, would it? Anyway, Phoebe said, these tents are great. I have one just like it. Use it all the time. When you're ready to close it up, the command word is Actil. The tent collapsed into a tiny rectangle. Phoebe picked it up, stuffed it into the satchel and handed the bag to Raina. I, I don't know what to say, Raina stammered. Thank you? Aw, Phoebe shrugged. It's the least I can do for... 50, weet 50 feet away, a side door banged open. An Amazon ran straight towards Hiller. The newcomer wore a black trouser suit, her long auburn hair pulled back in a ponytail. Raina recognised her from the battle at Camp Jupiter. Kinsey, is it? Isn't it? The girl gave her a distracted nod. Praetor. She whispered something in Hiller's ear. Hiller's express expression hardened. I see. She glanced at Raina. Something is wrong. We've lost contact with the outer defences. I'm afraid, Orion. Behind Raina, the metal doors exploded. Chapter 24. Raina. Raina reached for her sword, then realised she didn't have one. Get out of here, Phoebe readied her bow. Selene and Naomi ran to the smoking doorway, only to be cut down by black arrows. Phoebe screamed in rage. She returned fire as Amazons rushed forward with shields and swords. Raina! Hilla pulled her arm. We must leave. We can't just... My guards will buy you time, Hilla shouted. Your quest must succeed. Raina hated it, but she ran after Hilla. They reached the door side door and Raina glanced back. Dozens of wolves, grey wolves, like the ones in Portugal, surged into the warehouse. Amazons hurried to intercept them. The smoke-filled doorway was piled with bodies of the fallen. Celine, Naomi, Phoebe. The ginger-haired hunter, who'd have lived for thousands of years, now sprawled unmoving, her eyes wide with shock, an oversized black and red arrow buried in her gut. The Amazon Kinsey charged forward, long knives flashing. She leapt over the bodies and into the smoke. Hilla pulled Rainer into the passageway. Together they ran. They'll all die, Rainer yelled. There must be something. Don't be stupid, sister. Hilla's eyes were bright with tears. Orion outfoxed us. He's turned the ambush into a massacre. All we can do now is hold him back while you escape. You must get that statue to the Greeks and defeat Gaia. She led Rainer up a flight of stairs. They navigated a maze of corridors, then rounded a corner into a locker room. They found themselves face to face with a large grey wolf. But before the beast could even snarl, Hilla punched it between the eyes. The wolf crumpled. Over here! Hilla ran to the nearest row of lockers. Your weapons are inside. Hurry! Raina grabbed her knife, her sword and her pack. Then she followed her sister up a circular metal stairwell. The top dead-ended at the ceiling. Hilla turned and gave her a stern look. I, I won't have time to explain this, all right? Stay strong. Stay close. Raina wondered what could be worse than the scene they just left. Hilla pushed open the trapdoor and they climbed through into their old home. The main room was just as Raina remembered. Opaque skylights glowed on the 20-foot ceilings. The stark white walls were devoid of decoration. The furniture was oak, steel and white leather, impersonal and masculine. 
both sides of the room were overhung with ter terraces, which had always made Brainer feel like she was being watched, because often she was. Their father had done everything he could to make the centuries-old hacienda feel like a modern home. He'd added the skylights, painted everything white to make it brighter and airier, but he'd only succeeded in making the place look like a well-groomed corpse in a new suit. The trapdoor had opened into the massive fireplace. Why they even had a fireplace in Puerto Rico, Reina had never understood. But she and Hilla used to pretend the half was a secret hideout where their father couldn't find them. They used to imagine they could step inside and go to other places. Now, Hilla had made that true. She had linked her underground lair to their childhood home. Hilla, I told you we don't have time, but I own the building now. I put the deed in my name. You did what? I was tired of running from the past, Rainer. I decided to reclaim it. Rainer stared at her dumbfounded. You could reclaim a lost phone or a bag at the airport. You could even reclaim a hazardous waste dump. But this house and what had happened here, there was no reclaiming that. Sister, Hilla said, we're wasting time. Are you coming or not? Rainer eyed the balconies, half expecting luminous shapes to flicker at the railing. Have you seen them? Some of them. Papa? Of course not, Hilla snapped. You know he's gone for good. I don't know anything of the sort. How could you come back? Why? To understand, Hilla shouted. Don't you want to know how it happened to him? No, you can't learn anything from ghosts, Hilla. You of all people should realise. I'm leaving, Hilla said. Your friends are a few blocks away. Are you coming with me or should I tell them you died because you got lost in the past? I'm not the one who took possession of this place. Hilla turned on her heel and marched out of the front door. Rainer looked around one more time. She remembered her last day here, when she was ten years old. She could almost hear her father's angry roar echoing through the main room, the chorus of wailing ghosts on the balconies. She ran for the exit. She burst into warm afternoon sunlight and found that the streets hadn't changed. The crumbling pastel houses, the blue cobblestones, dozens of cats sleeping under cars or in the shade of banana trees. Rainer might have felt nostalgic, except that her sister stood a few feet away, facing Orion. Well now, the giant smiled, both daughters of Bologna together. Excellent. Rainer felt personally offended. She had worked up an image of Orion as a towering ugly demon, even worse than Polypotus, the giant who had attacked Camp Jupiter. Instead, Orion could have passed for human, a tall, muscular, handsome human. His skin was the colour of wheat toast, his dark hair was undercut, swept into spikes on top. With his black leather breeches and jerkin, his hunting knife and his bow and quiver, he might have been Robin Hood's evil, better-looking brother. Only his eyes ruined the image. At first glance, he appeared to be wearing military night vision goggles. Then Rainer realised they weren't goggles. They were the work of Hephaestus, bronze mechanical eyes embedded in the giant's sockets. Focusing rings spun and clicked as he regarded Rainer. Targeting lasers flashed red to green. Rainer got the uncomfortable impression he was seeing much more than her form, her heat signature, her heart rate, her level of fear. At his side, he held a black composite bow, almost as fancy as his eyes. Multiple strings ran through a series of pulleys that looked like miniature steam train wheels. The grip was polished bronze, studded with dials and buttons. He had no arrow knocked. He made no threatening moves. He smiled so dazzlingly, it was hard to remember he was an enemy. Someone who'd killed at least half a dozen hunters and Amazons to get here. Hilla drew her knives. Rainer, go. I will deal with this monster. Orion chuckled. Hilla, twice kill. You have courage. So did your lieutenants. They are dead. Hilla took a step forward. Raina grabbed her arm. Orion, she said, you have enough Amazon blood on your hands. Perhaps it's time you try a Roman. The giant's eyes clicked and dilated. Red laser dots floated across Raina's breastplate. Ah, the young Praetor. I admit I've been curious. Before I slay you, perhaps you'll enlighten me. Why would a child of Rome go to such lengths to help the Greeks? You have forfeited, forfeited your rank, abandoned your legion, made yourself an outlaw. And for what? Jason Grace scorned you. Percy Jackson refused you. Haven't you been, uh, what's the word, dumped enough? Rainer's ears buzzed. She recalled Aphrodite's warning two years ago in Charleston. You will not find love where you wish or where you hope. No demigod shall heal your heart. She forced herself to meet the giant's gaze. I don't define myself by the boys who may or may not like me. Brave words. The giant's smile was infuriating. But you are no different from the Amazons or the Hunters or Artemis herself. You speak of strength and independence. As soon as you face a man of true prowess, your confidence crumbles. 
You feel threatened by my dominance and how it attracts you. So you run or you surrender or you die. Hiller shrugged off Rainer's hand. I will kill you, giant. I will chop you into pieces so small. Hiller, Rainer interrupted. Whatever else happened here, she could not watch her sister die. Rainer had to keep the giant focused on her. Orion, you claim to be strong, yet you couldn't keep the vows of the hunt. You died rejected, and now you're running errands for your mother. So tell me again, how exactly are you threatening? Orion's jaw muscles clenched. His smile became thinner and colder. A good try, he admitted. You're hoping to imbalance me. You think perhaps if you keep me talking, reinforcements will save you? Alas, Praetor, there are no reinforcements. I burned your sister's underground lair with her own Greek fire. No one survived. Hiller roared and attacked. Orion hit her with the butt of his bow. She flew backwards into the street. Orion pulled an arrow from his quiver. Stop! Rainer yelled. Her heart hammered in her ribcage. She needed to find the giant's weakness. Barakina was only a few blocks away. If they could make it that far, Nico might be able to shadow travel them away. And the hunters couldn't all be dead. They'd been patrolling the entire perimeter of the old city. Surely some of them were still out there. Orion, you asked what motivates me. She kept her voice level. Don't you want your answer before you kill us? Surely it must puzzle you. Why women keep rejecting a big handsome guy like you? The giant knocked his arrow. Now you have mistaken me for Narcissus. I cannot be flattered. Of course not, Rainer said. Hilla rose with a murderous look on her face, but Rainer reached out with her senses, trying to share with her sister the most difficult kind of strength, restraint. Still, it must infuriate you. First you were dumped by a mortal princess. Merope, Orion sneered, a beautiful girl but stupid. If she'd had any sense, she would have understood I was flirting with her. Let me guess, Rainer said. She screamed and called for the guards instead. I was without my weapons at the time. You don't bring your bow and knives when you're courting a princess. The guards took me easily. Her father, the king, had me blinded and exiled. Just above Rainer's head, a pebble skittered across a clay-tiled roof. It might have been her imagination, but she remembered that sound from the many nights Hiller would sneak out of her own locked room and creep across the roof to check on her. It took all of Rainer's willpower not to glance up. But you got new eyes, she said to the giant. Hephaestus took pity on you. Yes, Orion's gaze become unfocused. Rainer could tell because the laser targets disappeared from her chest. I ended up on Delos, where I met Artemis. Do you know how strange it is to meet your mortal enemy and end up being attracted to her? He laughed. Praetor, what am I saying? Of course you know. Perhaps you feel for the Greeks as I felt for Artemis. A guilty fascination, an admiration that turns to love. But too much love is a poison, especially when that love is not returned. If you do not understand that already, Reina Ramirez Aravanu, you soon will. Hela, Hela limped forward, her knives still in hand. Sister, why do you let this beast talk? Let's put him down. Can you? Orion mused. Many have tried. Even Artemis's own brother, Apollo, was not able to kill me back in the ancient times. He had to use trickery to get rid of me. He didn't like you hanging out with his sister. Reina listened for more sounds from the roofs, but heard nothing. Apollo was jealous. The giant's fingers curled around his bowstring. He drew it back, setting the bow's wheels and pulleys spinning. He feared I might charm Artemis into forgetting her vows of maidenhood. And who knows, without Apollo's interference, perhaps I would have. She would have been happier. As your servant, Hilla growled, you meek, your meek little housewife. It hardly matters now, Orion said. At any rate, Apollo inflicted me with madness, a bloodlust to kill all the beasts of the earth. I slaughtered thousands before my mother, Gaia, finally put a stop to my rampage. She summoned a giant scorpion from the earth. It stabbed me in the back and its poison killed me. I owe her for that. You owe Gaia, Rainer said, for killing you. Orion's mechanical pupils spiralled into tiny glowing points. My mother showed me the truth. I was fighting against my own nature and it brought me nothing but misery. Giants are not meant to love mortals or gods. Gaia helped me accept what I am. Eventually, we all must return home, Praetor. We must embrace our past, no matter how bitter and dark. He nodded his chin towards the villa behind her. Just as you have done. You have your own share of ghosts, eh? Raina drew her sword. You can't learn anything from ghosts. She had told her sister. Perhaps she couldn't learn anything from giants either. This is not my home, she said, and we are not alike. I have seen the truth. The giant sounded truly sympathetic. You cling to the fantasy that you can make your enemies love you. You cannot, Rainer. There is no love for you at Camp Halfblood. 
Aphrodite's words echoed in her head. No demigod shall heal your heart. Raina studied the giant's handsome, cruel face, his glowing mechanical eyes. For a terrible moment, she could understand how even a goddess, even an eternal maiden like Artemis, might fall for her Orion's honeyed words. I could have killed you twenty times by now, the giant said. You realise that, don't you? Let me spare you. A simple show of faith is all I need. Tell me where the statue is. Raina almost dropped her sword. Where the statue is. Orion hadn't located the Athena Parthenos. The hunter's camouflage had worked. All this time the giant had been tracking Raina, which meant that even if she died right now, Nico and Coach Hedge might stay safe. The quest was not doomed. She felt as if she'd shed a hundred pounds of armour. She laughed. The sound echoed down the cobblestone street. <laughs> Phoebe outsmarted you, she said. By tracking me, you lost the statue. Now my friends are free to continue their mission. Orion curled his lip. Oh, I will find them, Praetor, after I deal with you. Then I suppose, Raina said, we will have to deal with you first. That is my sister, Hilla said proudly. Together, they charged. The giant's first shot would have skewered Raina, but Hilla was fast. She sliced the arrow out of the air and lunged at Orion. Raina stabbed at his chest. The giant intercepted both of their attacks with his bow. He kicked Hilla backwards into the hood of an old Chevy. Half a dozen cats scattered from underneath it. The giant spun, a dagger suddenly in his hand, and Raina just managed to dodge the blade. She stabbed again, ripping through his leather jerkin, but only managed to graze his chest. You fight well, Praetor, he admitted, but not well enough to live. Raina willed her blade to extend into a pillum. My death means nothing. If her friends could continue their quest in peace, she was fully prepared to go down fighting. But first she intended to hurt this giant so badly he would never forget her name. What about your sister's death? Orion asked. Does that mean nothing? Faster than Raina could blink, he sent an arrow flying towards Hilla's chest. A scream built in Raina's throat, but somehow Hilla caught the arrow. Hilla slid off the hood of the car, snapped the arrow with one hand. I am the queen of the Amazons, you idiot. I wear the royal belt. With the strength it gives me, I will avenge the Amazons you killed today. Hilla grabbed the front bumper of the Chevy and flipped the entire car towards Orion as easily as if she was splashing him with water in a swimming pool. The Chevy sandwiched Orion against the wall of the nearest house. Stucco cracked, a banana tree toppled, more cats fled. Raina ran towards the wreckage, but the giant bellowed and shoved the car away. You will die together, he promised. Two arrows appeared knocked in his bow, the string fully drawn back. Then the rooftops exploded with noise. Die! Gleason Hedge dropped directly behind Orion, smacking his baseball bat over the giant's head so hard the Louisville slugger cracked in half. At the same time, Nico D'Angelo dropped in front. He slashed his Tajian sword across the giant's bowstring, causing pulleys and gears to zip and creak, the string recoiling with hundreds of pounds of force until it whacked Orion in the nose like a hydraulic bullwhip. Ow! Orion staggered backwards, dropping his bow. Hunters of Artemis appeared along the rooftops, shooting Orion full of silver arrows until he resembled a glowing hedgehog. He staggered blindly, holding his nose, his face streaming with golden ichor. Someone grabbed Raina's arm. Come on, Thalia Grace had returned. Go with her, Hilla ordered. Raina's heart felt like it was shattering. Sister, you have to leave now. It was exactly what Hilla had said to her six years ago, the night they escaped their father's house. I'll delay Orion as long as possible. Hilla grabbed one of the giant's legs. She yanked him off balance and tossed him several blocks down the Cal San Jose to the general consternation of several dozen more cats. The hunters ran after him along the, the rooftops, shooting arrows that exploded in Greek fire, reefing the giant in flames. Your sister's right, Thalia said. You need to go. Nico and Hedge fell in alongside her, both looking very pleased with themselves. They had apparently gone shopping at the Barakina souvenir shop, where they'd replaced their dirty tattered clothes and shirts with loud tropical numbers. Nico, Raina said. You look, uh, not a word about the shirt, he warned. Not one word. Why did you come looking for me? She demanded. You could have got away free. The giant has been tracking me. If you had just left. You're welcome, cupcake, the coach grumbled. We weren't about to leave her without you. Now, let's get out of... He glanced over Raina's shoulder and his voice faltered. Raina turned. Behind her, the second-story balconies of her family house were crowded with glowing figures. 
A man with a forked beard and rusted conquistador armour. Another bearded man in 18th century pirate clothes. His shirt peppered with gunshot holes. A lady in a bloody nightgown. A US Navy captain in his dress whites. And a dozen more Raina knew from her childhood. All of them glaring at her accusingly. Their voices whispering in her mind. Traitor. Murderer. No. Raina felt like she was ten years old again. She wanted to curl up in the corner of her room and press her hands over her ears to stop the whispering. Nico took her arm. Raina, who are they? What do they? I can't, she pleaded. I, I can't. She'd spent so many years building a dam inside her to hold back the fear. Now it broke. Her strength washed away. It's all right. Nico gazed up at the balconies. The ghost disappeared, but Raina knew they weren't really gone. They were never really gone. We'll get you out of here, Nico promised. Let's move. Thalia took Raina's other arm. The four of them ran for the restaurant and the Athena Parthenos. Behind them, Raina heard Orion roaring in pain, Greek fire exploding. And in her mind, the voices still whispered, Murderer, traitor, you can never flee your crime. Chapter 25. Jason. Jason rose from his deathbed so he could drown with the rest of the crew. The ship was tilting so violently he had to climb the floor to get out of sickbay. The hull creaked, the engine groaned like a dying water buffalo. Cutting through the roar of the wind, the goddess Nike screamed from the stables, You can do better, Storm, give me a hundred and ten percent. Jason climbed the stairs to the middle deck. His legs shook, his head spun. The ship pitched a port, knocking him against the opposite wall. Hazel stumbled out of her cabin, hugging her stomach. Hate the ocean. When she saw him, her eyes widened. What are you doing out of bed? I'm going up there, he insisted. I can help. Hazel looked like she wanted to argue. Then the ship tilted to starboard and she staggered towards the bathroom, her hand over her mouth. Jason fought his way to the stairs. He hadn't been out of bed in a day and a half, ever since the girls got back from Sparta, and he'd unexpectedly collapsed. His muscles rebelled at the effort. His gut felt like Michael Varus was standing behind him, repeatedly stabbing him and yelling, Die like a Roman! Die like a Roman! Jason forced down the pain. He was tired of people taking care of him, whispering how worried they were. He was tired of dreaming about being a shish kebab. He'd spent enough time nursing the wound in his gut. Either it would kill him or it wouldn't. He wasn't going to wait around for the wound to decide. He had to help his friends. Somehow, he made it above deck. What he saw there made him almost as nauseous as Hazel. A wave the size of a skyscraper crashed over the forward deck, washing the front crossbows and half the port railing out to sea. The sails were ripped to shreds. Lightning flashed all around, hitting the sea like spotlights. Horizontal rain blasted Jason's face. The clouds were so dark he honestly couldn't tell if it was day or night. The crew was doing what they could, which wasn't much. Leo had lashed himself to the console with a bungee cord harness. That might have seemed like a good idea when he rigged it up, but every time a wave hit, he was washed away and then smacked back into his control board like a human paddleboard. Piper and Annabeth were trying to save the rigging. Since Sparta, they'd become quite a team, able to work together without even talking, which was just as well since they couldn't have heard each other over the storm. Frank, at least Jason assumed it was Frank, had turned into a gorilla. He was swinging upside down of the, off the starboard rail, using his massive strength and his flexible feet to hang on while he untangled some broken oars. Apparently the crew was trying to get the ship airborne, but even if they managed to take off, Jason wasn't sure the sky would be any safer. Even Festus, the figurehead, was trying to help. He spewed fire at the rain, though that didn't seem to discourage the storm. Only Percy was having any luck. He stood by the centre mast, his hands extended like he was on a tightrope. Every time the ship tilted, he pushed in the opposite direction and the hull stabilised. He summoned giant fists of water from the ocean to slam into the larger waves before they could reach the deck. So it looked like the ocean was hitting itself repeatedly in the face. With the storm as bad as it was, Jason realised the ship would have already capsized or been smashed to bits if Percy wasn't on the job. Jason staggered towards the mast. Leo yelled something, probably go downstairs, but Jason only waved back. He made it to Percy's side and grabbed his shoulder. Percy nodded like, sup? He didn't look shocked or demand that Jason go back to sickbay, which Jason appreciated. Percy could stay dry if he concentrated, but obviously he had bigger things to worry about right now. His dark hair was plastered to his face. His clothes were soaked and ripped. He shouted something in Jason's ear, but Jason could only make out a few words. Thing! Down! Stop it! Percy pointed over the side. Something is causing the storm? Jason asked. Percy grinned and tapped his ears. 
Clearly, he couldn't hear a word. He made a gesture with his hand like diving overboard, and then he tapped Jason on his chest. You want me to go? Jason felt kind of honoured. Everybody else had been treating him like a glass vase, but Percy, well, he seemed to figure that if Jason was on deck, he was ready for action. Happy to, Jason shouted, but I can't breathe underwater. Percy shrugged. Sorry, can't hear you. Then Percy ran to the starboard rail, pushed another massive wave away from the ship and jumped overboard. Jason glanced at Piper and Annabeth. They both clung to the rigging, staring at him in shock. Piper's expression said, are you out of your mind? He gave her an OK sign, partly to assure her that he would be fine, which he wasn't sure about, partly to agree that he was in fact crazy, which he was sure about. He staggered to the railing and looked up at the storm. Winds raged, clouds churned. Jason sensed an entire army of venti swirling above him, too angry and agitated to take physical form, but hungry for destruction. He raised his arm and summoned a lasso of wind. Jason had learned long ago that the best way to control a crowd of bullies was to pick the meanest, biggest kid and force him into submission. Then the others would fall in line. He lashed out with his wind rope, searching for strongest, most ornery ventus in the storm. He lassoed a nasty patch of storm cloud and pulled it in. You're serving me today. Howling in protest, the Ventus encircled him. The storm above the ship seemed to lessen just a bit, as if the other Venti were thinking, Oh crud, that guy means business. Jason levitated off the deck, encased in his own miniature tornado, spinning like a corkscrew, he plunged into the water. Jason assumed things would be calmer underwater. Not so much. Of course, that could have been due to his mode of travel. Riding a cyclone to the bottom of the ocean definitely gave him some unexpected turbulence. He dropped and swerved with no apparent logic, his ears popping, his stomach pressed against his ribs. Finally, he drifted to a stop next to Percy, who stood on a ledge jutting out over a deeper abyss. Hey, Percy said. Jason could hear him perfectly, though he wasn't sure how. What's going on? Is his Ventus air cocoon? His own voice sounded like he was talking through a vacuum cleaner. Percy pointed into the void. Wait for it. Three seconds later, a shaft of green light swept through the darkness like a spotlight and then disappeared. Something's down there, Percy said, stirring up this storm. He turned and sized up Jason's tornado. Nice outfit. Can you hold it together if we go deeper? I have no idea how I'm doing this, Jason said. Okay, Percy said. Well, just don't get knocked unconscious. Shut up, Jackson. Percy grinned. Let's see what's down there. They sank so deep that Jason couldn't see anything except Percy swimming next to him in the dim light of their gold and bronze blades. Every so often the green searchlight shot upward. Percy swam straight towards it. Jason's ventus crackled and roared, straining to escape. The smell of ozone made him light-headed, but he kept his shell of air intact. At last the darkness lessened below them. Soft white luminous patches, like schools of jellyfish, floated before Jason's eyes. As he approached the sea floor, he realised the patches were glowing fields of algae surrounding the ruins of a palace. Silt swirled through empty courtyards with abalone floors. Barnacle-covered Greek columns marched into the gloom. In the centre of the complex rose a citadel larger than Grand Central Station, its walls encrusted with pearls, its domed golden roof cracked open like an egg. Atlantis? Jason asked. That's a myth, Percy said. Uh, don't we deal in myths? No, I mean, it's a made-up myth, not like an actual true myth. So, this is why Annabeth is the brains of the operation, then. Shut up, Grace. They floated through the broken dome and down into shadows. This place seems familiar. Percy's voice became edgy. Almost like I've been here. The, the green spotlight flashed directly below them, blinding Jason. He dropped like a stone, touching down on the smooth marble floor. When his vision cleared, he saw that they weren't alone. Standing before them was a twenty-foot-tall woman in a flowing green dress, cinched at the waist with a belt of abalone shells. Her skin was as luminous white as the fields of algae. Her hair swayed and glowed like jellyfish tendrils. Her face was beautiful but unearthly, her eyes too bright, her features too delicate, her smile too cold, as if she'd been studying human smiles and hadn't quite mastered the art. Her hands rested on a disc of polished green metal about six feet in diameter, sitting on a bronze tripod. It reminded Jason of a steel drum he'd once seen a street performer play at the Embarcadero in San Francisco. The woman turned the metal disc like a steering wheel. A shaft of green light shot upward, churning the water, shaking the walls of the old palace. Shards from the domed ceiling broke and tumbled down in slow motion. You're making the storm, 
Jason said. Indeed I am. The woman's voice was melodic, yet it had a strange resonance, as if it extended past the human range of hearing. Pressure built between Jason's eyes. His sinuses felt like they might explode. Okay, I'll bite, Percy said. Who are you and what do you want? The woman turned towards him. Why? I am your sister, Perseus Jackson, and I wanted to meet you before you die. Chapter 26. Jason. Jason saw two options, fight or talk. Usually when faced with a creepy 20-foot tall lady with jellyfish hair, he would have gone with fight, but since she called Percy brother, that made him hesitate. Percy, do you know this individual? Percy shook his head. Doesn't look like my mum, so I'm going to guess we're related on the godly side. You a daughter of Poseidon, Miss... Uh... The pale lady raked her fingernails against the metal disc, making a screeching sound like a tortured wail. No one knows me, she sighed. Why would I assume my own brother would recognise me? I am Chimopalia. Percy and Jason exchanged looks. So, Percy said, we're going to call you Kim, and you'd be, um, near I then? A uh, minor goddess? Minor? By which, Jason said quickly, he means under the drinking age, because obviously you're so young and beautiful. Percy flashed him a look. Nice save. The goddess turned her full attention to Jason. She pointed her index finger and traced his outline in the water. Jason could feel his captured air spirit rippling around him as if it were being tickled. Jason Grace, said the goddess, son of Jupiter. Yeah, I'm a friend of Percy's. Kim's narrowed. So, it's true. These times make for strange friends and unexpected enemies. The Romans never worshipped me. To them I was a nameless fear, a sign of Neptune's greatest wrath. They never worshipped Kimopalia, the goddess of violent sea storms. She spun her disc. Another beam of green light flashed upward, churning the water and making the ruins rumble. Oh yeah, Percy said. The Romans aren't big on navies. They had like one rowboat, which I sank. Speaking of violent storms, you're doing a first-rate job upstairs. Thank you, said Kim. Thing is, our ship is caught in it, and it's kind of being ripped apart. I'm sure you didn't mean to. Oh yes, I did. You did? Percy grimaced. Well, that sucks. I don't suppose you'd cut it out then, if we asked nicely. No, the goddess agreed. Even now, the ship is close to sinking. I'm rather amazed it's held together this long. Excellent workmanship. Sparks flew from Jason's arms into the tornado. He thought about Piper and the rest of the crew, frantically trying to keep the ship in one piece. By coming down here, he and Percy had left the others defenceless. They had to act soon. Besides, Jason air, Jason's air was getting stale. He wasn't sure if it was possible to use up a Ventus by inhaling it, but if he was going to have to fight, he'd better take on Kim before he ran out of oxygen. The thing was, fighting a goddess on her home court wouldn't be easy. Even if they managed to take her down, there was no guarantee the storm would stop. So, Kim, he said, uh, what could we do to make you change your mind and let our ship go? Kim gave him that creepy alien smile. Son of Jupiter, do you know where you are? Jason was tempted to answer underwater. You mean these ruins? An ancient palace? Indeed, Kim said. The original palace of my father, Poseidon. Percy snapped his fingers, which sounded like a muffled explosion. That's why I recognised you. Dad's new crib in the Atlantic is kind of like this. I wouldn't know, Kim said. I am never invited to see my parents. I can only wander the ruins of their old domains. They find my presence disruptive. She spun her wheel again. The entire back wall of the building collapsed, sending a cloud of silt and algae through the chamber. Fortunately, the Ventus acted like a fan, blowing the debris out of Jason's face. Disruptive, Jason said. You? My father does not welcome me in his court, Kim said. He restricts my powers. The storm above, I haven't had this much fun in ages. Yet it is only a small taste of what I can do. A little goes a long way, Percy said. Anyway, to Jason's question about changing your mind... My father even married me off, Kim said, without my permission. He gave me away like a trophy to Briarus, a hundred-handed one, a, a reward for supporting the gods in the war of Kronos aeons ago. Percy's face brightened. Hey, I knew Briarus. He's a friend of mine. I freed him from Alcatraz. Yes, I know. Kim's eyes glinted coldly. I hate my husband. I was not at all pleased to have him back. Oh, so is Briarus around? Percy asked hopefully. Kim's laugh sounded like a dolphin chatter. He's off at Mount Olympus in New York, shoring up the gods' defences. Not that it will matter. 
My point, dear brother, is that Poseidon has never treated me fairly. I like to come here to his old palace because it pleases me to see his works in ruins. Some day, soon, his new palace will look like this one and the seas will rage unchecked. Percy looked at Jason. This is the part where she tells us she's working for Gaia. Yeah, Jason said, and the Earth Mother promised her a better deal once the gods are destroyed, blah, blah, blah. He turned to Kim. You understand that Gaia won't keep her promises right. She's using you, just like she's using the giants. I am touched by your concern, said the goddess. The Olympian gods, on the other hand, have never used me, eh? Percy spread his hands. At least the Olympians are trying. After the last Titan war, they started paying more attention to the other gods. A lot of them have cabins now at Camp Half-Blood. Hecate, Hades, Hebe, Hypnos, uh, and probably some that don't begin with H, too. Uh, we give them offerings at every meal, cool banners, special recognition in the end of summer program. And do I get such offerings? Kim asked. Well, no, uh, we didn't know you existed, but uh, then save your words, brother. Kim's jellyfish tentacle hair floated towards him, as if anxious to paralyse new prey. I've heard so much about the great Percy Jackson. The giants are quite obsessed with capturing you. I must say, I don't see what the fuss is about. Thanks, sis, but if you're going to try to kill me, i got to warn you, it's been tried before. I've faced a lot of goddesses recently. Nike, Aklis, even Nyx herself. Compared to them, you're not scaring me. Also, you laugh like a dolphin. Kim's delicate nostrils flared. Jason got his sword ready. Oh, I won't kill you, Kim said. My part of the bargain was simply to get your attention. Someone else is here, though, who very much wants to kill you. Above them, at the edge of the broken roof, a dark shape appeared, a figure even taller than Kimapalea. The son of Neptune, boomed a deep voice. The giant floated down, clouds of dark, vicious fluid, poison, perhaps, curled from his blue skin. His green breastplate was fashioned to resemble a cluster of open, hungry mouths, and his hands were the weapons of a retiris, a trident and a weighted net. Jason had never met this particular giant, but he'd heard stories. Polypetus, he said, the anti-Poseidon. The giant shook his dreadlocks. A dozen serpents swam three, each one lime green with a frilled crown around its head. Basilisks. Indeed, son of Rome, the giant said. But if you'll excuse me, my immediate business is with Perseus Jackson. I tracked him all the way across Tartarus. Now, here in his father's ruins, I mean to crush him once and for all. Chapter 27. Jason. Jason hated basilisks. The little scum suckers loved to burrow under their temples in New Rome. Back when Jason was a centurion, his cohort always got the unpopular chore of clearing out their nests. A basilisk didn't look like much, just an arm-length serpent with yellow eyes and a white frill collar, but it moved fast and could kill anything it touched. Jason had never faced more than two at a time. Now a dozen were swimming around the giant's legs. The only good thing, underwater basilisks wouldn't be able to breathe fire, but that didn't make them any less deadly. Two of the serpents shot towards Percy. He sliced them in half. The other ten swirled around him just out of Blade's reach. They writhed back and forth in a hypnotic pattern, looking for an opening. One bite, one touch was all it would take. Hey, Jason yelled, how about some love over here? The snakes ignored him. So did the giant who stood back and watched with a smug smile, apparently happy for his pets to do the killing. Kimapalea, Jason tried his best to pronounce her name right. You have to stop this. She regarded him with her glowing white eyes. Why would I do that? The Earth Mother has promised me unrestricted power. Could you make me a better offer? A better offer. He sensed the possibility of an opening, room to negotiate. But what did he have that a storm goddess would want? The basilisks closed in on Percy. He blasted them away with currents of water, but they just kept circling. Hey, basilisks, Jason yelled. Still no reaction. He could charge in and help, but even together, he and Percy couldn't possibly fight off ten basilisks at once. He needed a better solution. He glanced up. A thunderstorm raged above, but they were hundreds of feet down. He couldn't possibly summon lightning at the bottom of the sea. Could he? Even if he could, water conducted electricity a little too well. He might fry Percy. But he couldn't think of a better option. He thrust up his sword. Immediately, the blade glowed red hot. A diffuse cloud of yellow light billowed through the depths, like someone had poured liquid neon into the water. The light hit Jason's sword and splayed, sprayed outwards in ten separate tendrils, zapping the basilisks. Their eyes went dark. Their frills disintegrated. All ten serpents turned belly up and floated dead in the water. 
Next time, Jason said, look at me when I'm talking to you. Polybatus' smile curdled. Are you so anxious to die, Roman? Percy raised his sword. He curled himself, hurled himself at the giant, but Polybatus swept his hand through the water, leaving an arc of black, oily poison. Percy charged straight into it, faster than Jason could yell, Dude, what are you thinking? Percy dropped Riptide. He gasped, clawing at his throat. The giant threw his weighted net and Percy collapsed to the floor, hopelessly entangled as the poison thickened around him. Let him go! Jason's voice cracked with panic. The giant chuckled. Don't worry, son of Jupiter. Your friend will take a long time to die. After all the trouble he's caused me, I wouldn't dream of killing him quickly. Noxious clouds expanded around the giant, filling the ruins like a thick cigar smoke. Jason scrambled backwards, not fast enough, but his ventus proved a useful filter. As the poison engulfed him, the miniature tornado spun faster, repelling the clouds. Kimopalea wrinkled her nose and waved away the darkness, but otherwise it didn't seem to affect her. Percy writhed in the net, his face turning green. Jason charged to help him, but the giant blocked him with his huge trident. Oh, I can't let you ruin my fun, Polypotus chided. The poison will kill him eventually, but first came the paralysis, and hours of excruciating pain. I want him to have the full experience. He can watch as I destroy you, Jason Grace. Polybatus advanced slowly, giving Jason plenty of time to contemplate the three-storey tall pat tower of armour and muscle bearing down on him. He dodged the trident and, using his ventus to shoot forward, jabbed his sword into the giant's reptilian leg. Polybatus roared and stumbled, golden ichor pluming from the wound. Kim, Jason yelled, is this really what you want? The storm goddess looked rather bored, idly spinning her metal disc. Unlimited power? Why not? But is it any fun? Jason asked. So you destroy our ship. You destroy the entire coastline of the world. Once Gaia wipes out human civilization, who's left to fear you? You'll still be unknown. Polybatus turned. You are a pest, son of Jupiter. You will be crushed. Jason tried to summon more lightning. Nothing happened. If he ever met his dad, he'd have, a, have to petition for an increased daily allowance of bolts. Jason managed to avoid the prongs of the trident again, but the giant swung the other end around and smacked him in the chest. Jason reeled back, stunned and in pain. Polybatus came in for the kill. Just before the trident would have perforated him, Jason's ventus acted on its own. It spiralled sideways, whisking Jason thirty feet across the courtyard. Thanks, buddy, Jason thought. I owe you some air freshener. If the Ventus liked that idea, Jason couldn't tell. Actually, Jason Grace, Kim said, studying her fingernails. Now that you mention it, I do enjoy being feared by mortals. I am not feared enough. I can help with that. Jason dodged another swipe of the trident. He extended his gladius into a javelin and poked Polybatus in the eye. Arrgh! The giant staggered. Percy writhed in the net, but his movements were getting sluggish. Jason needed to hurry. He had to get Percy to sickbay, and if the storm kept raging above them, there wouldn't be any sickbay to get him to. He flew to Kim's side. You know gods depend on mortals. The more we honour you, the more powerful you get. I wouldn't know. I've never been honoured. She ignored Polypotus, who was now stampeding around her, trying to swat Jason out of his whirlwind. Jason did his best to keep the goddess between them. I can change that, he promised. I will personally arrange a shrine for you on Temple Hill in New Rome. Your first ever Roman shrine. I'll raise one at Camp Half-Blood as well, right on the shore of Long Island Sound. Imagine being honoured and feared, and feared by both Greeks and Romans. You'll be famous. Stop talking! Polybatus swung his trident like a baseball bat. Jason ducked. Kim did not. The giant slammed her in the ribcage so hard that strands of her jellyfish hair came loose and drifted through the poisoned water. Polybatus's eyes widened. I'm sorry, Kimopalea. You should have... Uh, you should have, shouldn't have been in the way. In the way? The goddess straightened. I am in the way. You heard him, Jason said. You're nothing but a tool for the giants. They'll cast you aside as soon as they're through destroying the mortals. Then no demigods, no shrines, no fear, no respect. Lies. Polypotus tried to stab him, but Jason hid behind the goddess's dress. Kimopalea, when Gaia rules, you will rage and storm without restraint. Will there be mortals to terrorise? Kim asked. Well, no. Ships to destroy? Demigods to cower in awe? Um, help me, Jason urged. Together, a goddess and demigod can kill a giant. No! Polypotus suddenly looked very nervous. No, that's a terrible idea. Gaia will be most displeased. If Gaia wakes, 
Jason said. The mighty Kimapalea can help us make sure that that na na never happens. Then all demigods will honour you big time. Will they cower? Kim asked. Tons of cowering, plus your name in the summer programme. A custom designed banner, a cabinet camp half-blood, two shrines. I'll even throw in a Kimapalea action figure. No, Polybatus wailed. Not merchandising rights. Kimapalea turned on the giant. I'm afraid that deal beats what Gaia has offered. Unacceptable, the giant bellowed. You cannot trust this vile Roman. If I don't honour the bargain, Jason said, Kim can always kill me. With Gaia, she has no guarantee at all. That, Kim said, is difficult to argue with. As Polypetus struggled to answer, Jason charged forward and stabbed his javelin in the giant's gut. Kim lifted her bronze disc from its pedestal. Say goodbye, Polybatus. She spun the disc at the giant's neck. Turned out the rim was sharp. Polybatus found it difficult to say goodbye since he no longer had a head. Chapter 28. Jason. Poison is a nasty habit. Kimapalea waved her hand and the murky clouds dissipated. Second-hand poison can kill a person, you know. Jason wasn't too fond of first-hand poison either, but he decided not to mention that. He cut Percy out of the net and propped him against the temple wall, enveloping him in the airy shell of the Ventus. The oxygen was getting thin, but Jason hoped it might help expel the poison from his friend's lungs. It seemed to work. Percy doubled over and began to retch. Oh, thanks. Jason exhaled with relief. You had me worried there, bro. Percy blinked cross-eyed. I'm still a little fuzzy, but did you promise Kim an action figure? The goddess loomed over them. Indeed he did, and I expect him to deliver. I will, Jason said. When we win this war, I'm going to make sure all the gods get recognised. He put a hand on Percy's shoulder. My friend here started that process last summer. He made the Olympians promise to pay you guys more attention. Kim sniffed. We know what an Olympian promise is worth, which is why I'm going to finish the job. Jason didn't know where these words were coming from, but the idea felt absolutely right. I'll make sure none of the gods are forgotten at either camp. Maybe they'll get temples or cabins, or at least shrines. Or collectible trading cards, Kim suggested. Sure, Jason smiled. I'll go back and forth between the camps until the job is done. Percy whistled. You're talking about dozens of gods. Hundreds, Kim corrected. Well then, Jason said. Might take a while, but you'll be first on the list, Kimapalea, the storm goddess who beheaded a giant and saved our quest. Kim stroked her jellyfish hair. That will do nicely, she regarded Percy, though I am still sorry I won't see you die. I get that comment a lot, Percy said. Now, about, your sh about our ship? Still in one piece, said the goddess. Not in very good shape, but you should be able to make it to Delos. Thank you, Jason said. Yeah, Percy said. And really, your husband, Briarus, is a good dude. You should give him a chance. The goddess picked up her bronze disc. Don't push your luck, brother. Briarus has fifty faces. All of them are ugly. He's got a hundred hands and he's still all thumbs around the house. Okay, Percy relented. Not pushing my luck. Kim turned over the disc, revealing straps on the bottom sh side like a shield. She slipped it over her shoulders, Captain America style. I will be watching your progress. Polybatus was not boasting when he warned that your blood would awaken the Earth Mother. The giants are very confident of this. My blood personally? Percy asked. Kim's smile was even creepier than usual. I am not an oracle, but I heard what the seer Phineas told you in the city of Portland. You will face a sacrifice that you may not be able to make, and it will cost you the world. You have yet to face your fatal flaw, my brother. Look around. All works of gods and men eventually turn to ruins. Would it not be easier to flee into the depths with that girlfriend of yours? Percy put his hand on Jason's shoulder and struggled to his feet. Juno offered me a choice like that, back when I found Camp Jupiter. I'll give you the same answer. I don't run when my friends need me. Kim turned up her palms. And there is your flaw, being unable to step away. I will retreat to the depths and watch this battle unfold. You should know that the forces of the ocean are also at war. Your friend Hazel Levesque made quite an impression on the Mer people and their mentors, Aphros and Bifos. The fish pony dudes, Percy muttered. They didn't want to meet me. Even now they are waging war for your sake, Kim said, trying to keep Gaia's allies away from Long Island. Whether or not they will survive, that remains to be seen. As for you, Jason Grace, your path will be no easier than your friends. You will be tricked. You will face unbearable sorrow. Jason tried to keep from sparking. He wasn't sure Percy's heart could take the shock. Kim, you said you're not an oracle. They should give you the job. You're definitely depressing enough. 
The goddess let loose her dolphin laugh. You amuse me, son of Jupiter. I hope you live to defeat Gaia. Thanks, he said. Any pointers on defeating a goddess who can't be defeated? Kimopelea tilted her head. Oh, but you know the answer. You are a child of the sky, with storms in your blood. A primordial god has been defeated once before. You know of whom I speak. Jason's inside started twirling and swirling faster than the Ventus. Uranus, the first god of the sky. But that means, yes. Kim's alien features took on an expression that almost resembled sympathy. Let us hope it does not come to that. If Gaia does wake, well, your task will not be easy. But if you win, remember your promise, Pontifex. Jason took a moment to process her words. I'm not a priest. No. Kim's white eyes gleamed. By the way, your Ventus servant says he wishes to be freed. Since he has helped you, he hopes you will let him go when you reach the surface. He promises he will not bother you a third time. A third time? Kim paused as if listening. He says he joined the storm above to take revenge on you. But had he known how strong you've become since the Grand Canyon, he never would have approached your ship. The Grand Canyon? Jason recalled that day on the Skywalk, when one of his jerk classmates turned out to be a wind spirit. Dylan? Are you kidding me? I'm breathing Dylan. Yes, Kim said. That seems to be his name. Jason shuddered. I'll let him go as soon as I reach the surface. No worries. Farewell then, said the goddess, and may the fates smile upon you, assuming the fates survive. They needed to leave. Jason was running out of air. Dylan air. Gross. And everyone on the Argo too would be worried about them. But Percy was still woozy from the poison, so they sat on the edge of the ruined Golden Dome for a few minutes to let Percy catch his breath. Or catch his water, whatever a son of Poseidon catches when he's at the bottom of the ocean. Thanks, man, Percy said. You saved my life. Hey, that's what we do for our friends. But, uh, the Jupiter guy saving the Poseidon guy at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe we can keep the details to ourselves. Otherwise, I'll never hear the end of it. Jason grinned. <laughs> you got it. How are you feeling? Better, I... I have to admit, when I was choking on that poison, I kept thinking about Aklis, the misery goddess in Tartarus. I almost destroyed her with poison. He shivered. It felt good, but in a bad way. If Annabeth hadn't stopped me. But she did, Jason said. That's another thing friends have to do for each other. Yeah, thing is, as I was choking just now, I kept thinking, this is payback for Aklis. The fates are letting me die the same way I tried to kill that goddess. And honestly, a part of me felt I deserved it. That's why I didn't try to control the giant's poison and move it away from me. That probably sounds crazy. Jason fought back to Ithaca when he was despairing over the visit from his mum's spirit. No, I think I get it. Percy studied his face. When Jason didn't say any more, Percy changed the subject. What did Kim mean about defeating Gaia? You mentioned Uranus. Jason stared at the silt swirling between the columns of the old palace. The sky god. The titans defeated him by calling him down to the earth. They got him away from his home territory, ambushed him, held him down and cut him up. Percy looked like his nausea was coming back. How would we do that with Gaia? Jason recalled a line from the prophecy. To storm or fire, the world must fall. He had an idea what that meant now. But if he was right, Percy wouldn't be able to help. In fact, he might unintentionally make things harder. I don't run when my friends need me, Percy had said. And there is your flaw, Kim had warned, being unable to step away. Today was the 27th of July. In five days, Jason would know if he was right. Let's get to Delos first, he said. Apollo and Artemis might have some advice. Percy nodded, though he didn't seem satisfied with that answer. Why did Kimopalea call you Pontiac? Jason's laugh literally cleared the air. <laughs> Pontifex. It means priest. Oh, Percy frowned. Still sounds like a kind of car. The new Pontifex XLS. Will you have to wear a collar and bless people? Nah, Romans used to have a Pontifex Maximus, who oversaw all the proper sacrifices and whatnot, to make sure none of the gods got mad, which I offered to do. I guess it sounds, well, it does sound like a Pontifex's job. So you meant it? Percy asked. You're really going to try building shrines for all the minor gods? Yeah, I never really thought about it before, but I like the idea of going back and forth between the two camps, assuming, you know, we make it through next week and the two camps still exist. What you did last year on Olympus, turning down immortality and asking the gods to play nice instead, that was noble, man. Percy grunted. Believe me, some days, some, some days I regret the choice. Oh, you want to turn down our offer? Okay, fine, zap. Lose your memory. Go to Tartarus. You did what a hero should do. I admire you for that. The least I can do, if we survive, is continue that work. Make sure all the gods get some recognition. 
Who knows, if the gods get along better, maybe we can stop more of these wars from breaking out. That would most definitely be good, Percy agreed. You know, you look different, better different. Does your wound still hurt? My wound? Jason had been so busy with the giant and the goddess, he'd forgotten about the sword wound in his gut, even though he'd been dying from it in sickbay only an hour ago. He lifted his shirt and pulled away the bandages. No smoke, no bleeding, no scar, no pain. It's gone, he said, stunned. I feel completely normal. What the heck? You beat it, man, Percy laughed. You found your own cure. Jason considered that. He guessed it must be true. Maybe putting aside his pain to help his friends had done the trick. Or maybe his decision to honour the gods at both camps had healed him, giving him a clear path to the future. Roman or Greek, the difference didn't matter. Like he'd told the ghosts at Ithaca, his family had just got to be, had just got bigger. Now he saw his place in it. He would keep his promise to the storm goddess. And because of that, Michael Varus's sword meant nothing. Die a Roman. No, if he had to die, he would die a son of Jupiter, a child of the gods, the blood of Olympus. But he wasn't about to let himself get sacrificed, at least not without a fight. Come on. Jason clapped his friend on the back. Let's go check on our ship.